Hey everyone, you're listening to the Leadership Project Podcast with your host Mick Spears. We've got a great treat for you today as we are joined by Joe, the brand builder Escobedo, and he's going to share his knowledge and experience about brand building and the importance of personal branding in anyone's career. Sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome back to The Leadership Project. We've got a great special guest joining us today, Joe, the brand builder, Escobedo. And I love that. I mean, Joe's all about brand building and he even has this kind of moniker, just like he's a title fighter or some kind of uh, larger than life character. And for those that have met him, he is exactly that. He's the CEO of Esco Media, and he's the author of the Asian Growth Stories, How to Do Business in Asia. Been living here in Singapore for six years. He's a published author also in Forbes and was a content marketing consultant with LinkedIn. And he's also a podcast host as well. So he's uh, had two podcasts that I'm aware of. Maybe he can correct me on that one in a moment. But he's had a cup of Joe, and now uh, more recently, he has one about doing marketing in Asia and uh, B2B marketing in Asia, and I'll let him introduce that shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce all of our audience to Joe. How are you doing today? Doing good. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I appreciate it. Okay, so Joe, I mean, uh, I've already given a little bit of introduction there, but we'd love to hear from you. So tell us a little bit more about your background and introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So I think one of the common questions I always get is, where are you from? Um, Because of the last name, and it's actually, I'll I'll share the longer story because I think it makes sense in terms of the work we're doing now. So uh, I'm uh, Spanish, my father's side, uh, French, my mother's side, but I was born in Germany. (laughs) Oh. <laughs> and I actually moved to the States when I was quite young, but uh, lived in Germany for a little bit. And then when I was 21, I moved to China to do my master's. Oh, wow. Uh, lived there for several years. And then I've been in Singapore since. So I think that experience working with different cultures, kind of being a third culture kid in my entire life, and now I've spent half my life outside of the States, has really helped open up what we're doing now. And being able to connect with different leaders from different markets, different seniorities. And I think that that experience growing up has really helped set the foundation for what we're doing currently. Oh, wow. That's amazing. You are a true world citizen. And I have to say that I knew that you'd been doing quite a bit in Asia in recent times, but I had no idea you had that history. And I have been cyber stalking you as I do with all of my podcast guests. And I don't mean to scare anyone off of a future guest that come onto the show. And I saw that you went to the University of Oklahoma and I assumed that was where you're born and bred. So that's really interesting. Born in Germany. I was born in, born in Germany. Yeah. I moved to the States when I was uh, relatively young, but yeah, I was born in, born in Germany. Oh, wow. Okay. And then tell us more about that, your experiences in China in particular. That also got my attention. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually did my master's in international business and finance. And then after graduating, I actually worked as a journalist in North China. So in Tianjin, China, I was a business and entertainment journalist. Oh, wow. Um, so covering all the um, developments. So when Air Asia was launching there many, many years ago, I interviewed uh, Tony Fernandez, who is now the CEO or chairman of the organization. Um, so a lot of really great opportunities to work on my interviewing skills. And then from there, I, I moved on to PR and communications. So by the time I was 26, I was working um, with uh, Nike on oh, the wow. Beijing okay. Olympics. Yeah. Uh, so I was managing communications, international communications for them. Um, and it was an incredible experience to be with Nike behind the scenes, to meet some of the Olympic athletes. Uh, it was just an incredible experience. I think it was also kind of a very stressful experience, which I think helped set me up for later in life because doing any type of, I was doing crisis communications in China which as you can imagine, is, is quite fast paced, quite stressful. Um, so it really helped me adapt now to being an entrepreneur, which is the same thing, very fast paced, very high pressure. But I had that opportunity to do it when I was relatively young. And I think it's helped me in what we're currently doing. 
Oh, wow. That's really amazing. And uh, I have to say, like China, for those in our audience, we go worldwide, of course, but for those in our audience that have not spent any time in China or work there, it really does feel like a different world. And I really understand what you're talking about there in terms of fast paced uh, pressure and uh, a really, like I said, a different world. And to be there during the Olympics, uh, you know, when the spotlight is on there, that must have been a real experience. It, it was. It was quite an opportunity. I'm curious already, and I wasn't planning to ask you this question early on, but what leadership lessons did you take out of that experience, like working with Nike around Olympics and around you know, Olympic-level athletes? Any leadership lessons that you can share with our audience from that period in your life? Yeah, I think one thing that I learned is how to draw parallels in terms of storytelling. So Nike is obviously the master in terms of storytelling as a, as a leader in their space. But one thing that was interesting is how they drew parallels to the Olympic athletes. Mm. So just like the Nike consumers, Olympic athletes want to be the best at what they're doing. They train hard, you know, they eat well. And I think that parallels between you know, the athletic world and what Nike was trying to convey to consumers in China you could see a strong parallel. So I think that storytelling was something that really, really stuck with me um, during that experience working with Nike. The power of storytelling, I think, is something that many people are still discovering. Uh, I'm obviously a big fan of it and it underpins a lot of the things that I do and in my leadership style, but also in general life. But the power of storytelling, I think many people are still discovering what that means and to get that emotional connection with your audience, etc. How did your roads lead to Singapore? How did you end up here? So that's an interesting one. I get this question quite a lot too. And I was actually a trailing spouse. Um, so my, my fiance or girlfriend, now wife, uh, two kids later, uh, moved down here first. So we were doing long distance relationship for about a year. And so finally we said, okay, either I move here or, you know what, we ended. So I ended up moving here. And yeah, it was interesting to be the trailing spouse because she already had a job. Hmm. I think I really struggled when I first came here because uh, they were kind of clamping down on, you know, for employment at the time. So getting a job, I tell a story about getting a job was really, really hard. I was coming from China at the time, which if you come from China now, everyone wants, you know, China experience. But this was about six, seven years ago when China still had a bit of a stigma behind it. So people were a little bit apprehensive about giving someone from China. Um, a, a regional Southeast Asia role. So I definitely had a huge uphill battle when I came down here, even though, like you said, I had experience working with Nike, Mercedes Benz in China, it was still a huge obstacle. So one thing I think going back to the power of, you know, uh, leadership as well as ne was networking. So how do you build that network? This is something I think is extremely important for every leader. And one thing that I did, which worked out like, incredible was to find out fellow alumni. So going back, because I'm University of uh, Oklahoma City University, uh, there actually is a exchange program with the Singapore University as well, too. There's actually a lot of people in Singapore who have been to Oklahoma, have been to the campus. Um, so I think finding out who those people were on LinkedIn, you know, asking them for coffee had a much higher conversion rate, so to mm. speak, versus reaching out to, to other people. So it's funny enough, one of the people that I met up with coffee, I actually ended up working with at LinkedIn. She sat right across from me like six years later um, across the table at me at LinkedIn. So it's funny how things can come full circle like that. That's really cool, Joe. I, I really like that story. And uh, great to hear International Women's Day last week. It's a celebration of International Women's Day all month, if you like. So it's just so great to hear a story of a trailing spouse where the shoe was on the other foot compared to, let's say, the traditional norm. And here at the Leadership Project, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in diversity and inclusion. We believe in equal rights and equal opportunity. So it's just a wonderful story to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. Tell us about the brand builder. How do you end up being called literally all over LinkedIn, Joe, the brand builder, Escobedo? How does that come about? So that, that's a funny story as well. In my previous company, we were putting together a pitch deck for new, for new clients. And so I was the one responsible for marketing. So I was giving each of the, my colleagues like cool names. Like one of them was the digital transformer. One of them was something else. And 
lastly was my photo. And I said, I don't know what nickname to give myself. It's, it's quite awkward. <laughs> so I was talking to one of my colleagues next to me. I said, look, I have all these great names for you guys. What do you think mine should be? And he just looked at me instantaneously and said, brand builder. And I was like, okay, put it in the deck. Um, and so I just put it on LinkedIn as kind of just an experiment to see if it stuck. Because I think my last name is a bit difficult to remember. And so I was trying to think of what's a moniker to make it easier. And it's funny because it stuck with me since. This was about five years ago. And even when I was at Forbes, I was introducing myself. I remember one time to a CEO of a company. And I said, hi, I'm J-. And before I could finish, he said, oh, I know who you are. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, you're the brand builder. And I was like, yes, 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 I have. <laughs> So that's yeah. outstanding. I've got to admit, that's exactly uh, how I think of you. And I, I see you on LinkedIn all the time. And I don't think of you as Joe Escobedo. And uh, my humblest apologies to your parents. But I think of you as Joe, the brand builder. So it, it has absolutely stuck. Now, on our program, we are trying to help leaders adapt to a modern world, adapt mm. to a digital world adapt to an ever-changing world. So I'd like to really drill down uh, for our audience and to uh, go through a little bit more detail about who we're really talking about. We're talking about young leaders that are looking to make a transition from individual contributor through to manager or leader. We're talking about leaders that are lifelong learners, so people that are always looking to sharpen the saw. Or we're talking about very experienced leaders that might be struggling with a transition to more modern thinking and modern day leadership styles. So I'd like to drill down now and talk about the brand building aspect of that and about the importance of brand and break it down into a few different topics. So specifically, as a leader, what do you think are the important attributes that a leader needs to have to both protect and project their company's brand? That's a very good question. I think for me, branding really boils down to two factors, one of which is people. I mean, the people essentially are the brand. We'll talk about that from a personal branding. But even if you look at it from a marketing and sales point of view, I always tell people, yes, they're buying the brand, but that is just a, a box they're ticking. They're really buying is Mick, for example, if they do business with you and your organization. So I think it's important to understand that the people you hire and the culture you build has a huge impact in terms of your brand externally. So that for me is really the heart of the brand is the people behind it. And the other thing that's important to remember is brand is perception. So people know me as the brand builder because I go out that way. Um, my messaging is that way. I, I create educational content around that. So the perception is that I am the brand builder and I'm quote unquote an expert and I get you know, a lot of people reaching out to me saying, can you do a branding workshop or storytelling workshop with, with my team? And so I think that just comes through the perception that they have. There's no point. I remember the mistake that I made, and I think this is something we can talk about with personal branding, is when I was just trying to come up with my headlines, this was like six, seven years ago, I, I made the mistake of having like the guru in my title. And looking back, it was, it was a terrible mistake. But it's funny because no one ever thought of me that way when I had that title in. But now that I've kind of removed it and I said, okay, here's what I am, here's, here's what we do, um, the, the perception has shifted where they say, okay, now I see what you do, I understand it, and therefore I want to be part of what you're doing. Whether it's your podcast, whether it's your business, whether it's a, you know, a content collaboration, whatever it is, they want to be part of because the perception is that I've clearly defined what is, the, I guess, my unique positioning in the market and where I can add the most value. And for me, it really is branding because it's something I'm very passionate about. I eat, sleep, and breathe branding. And so I just love talking to people about it. And I think because of that you know, enthusiasm perception, it has opened up so many doors and opportunities, even this, this wonderful opportunity we're having just now. For a leader that might not fully understand the importance of brand or even what makes up a brand, you mentioned about people. And that's something that a lot of people don't actually think about that the people are the brand or the people are part of the brand. What are the other aspects that you think are important in a brand? I mean, everyone thinks about logos. I think that one's an obvious one, but it's far more than that. What do you think are all the things that make up a brand? So it's funny because mine is a bit counterintuitive because I think a lot of people overemphasis 
put over emphasis on the the aesthetics. And I think they are important, but I think when you're just starting out, like let's say you're an entrepreneur, I, I will be honest, I didn't have a, a website or a logo for the first few years and we we're still selling out like hotcakes um, because I realized that a brand, a logo is important to me. It doesn't necessarily matter to the customer or the people we're, we're doing business with. So I think a lot of people, when they tell me about, oh, we launched a new brand campaign, I say, okay, great. What did you do? And they said, oh, we updated our logo. We changed the font. Oh, we changed the color slightly. I'm like, that to me really isn't, you know, a brand campaign. A brand campaign is really exemplifying what you talk about. So really understanding the values. And for us, it's really about transparency, being honest, and just being educational as much as possible. And I think that shines through in what we do. So understanding the values, not just talking about it, because I think most brands in their campaigns, their messaging, they say, we are this, we are that. But at the end of the day, no one really believes them because they're not exemplifying it. So I think it's important for uh, brands to really understand what are the values and the messaging. And one thing we used to do with, with Nike and Mercedes-Benz is build like a message house. Mm. So what is that overarching pillar message you want, you want to build out? That's something that uh, goes across the board. And then you have, you think of a columns in a different, uh, in a building. Each of those columns, we talked about three to five, are the, the messaging that support that that kind of fluffy or, or broader kind of vision. And I think you, beyond that, you need to have one level below that, which is proof points. So it's not enough to say, look, we are super transparent, but we are super practical in terms of our education. We have to back that up, particularly in Asia. So for example, when people ask me, yes, your workshops are very practical, I can say that's because we spend X number of hours working on each one. We've trained over you know, 8,000 executives or we work with these brands. So then they start putting it together. It's not just me saying, look, we're the best because I think too many brands try to do that and it, it comes off the wrong way, but really backing it up with, with strong, consistent messaging as well as proof points is a very, very great way to consistently build that brand over a longer period. That's great, Joe. I've, I've recently launched a new brand corporately uh, in my day job, if you like, and we put a lot of work. There are some things that are just recognizable they're about brand awareness so that when you see our colors when you see our font when you see our logo you know all of those things are about recognition and about awareness but really the things that underpin that brand are our values our beliefs our why the reason yes. why we exist our vision our mission the voice in which we speak was something yeah. that we put a lot of effort into because we wanted to be seen as okay, part of a very traditional and conservative engineering company and we mm. wanted to be seen as the fresh new approach. So the whole voice changed from very kind of feature-oriented and, and specification-oriented all the way through to more talking about benefits and about our end customers, et cetera. So even the voice and the different types of language that you, you, that you use through to the music that you use in the background of your videos, the iconography, the stock images. And uh, I, actually, I know that you don't like stock images too much, by the way. I read that about you. But the, you know what I mean? The, the, yeah. the imagery that you use, they're all part of your brand. Yes, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that the visual is, is definitely a key element. I think where a lot of brands really get it wrong, though, is just over relying on that and really un misunderstanding like the messaging and the actual value you bring in yeah. the conversation, not just the logos. But I think, yes, absolutely. It goes back to consistency. Yeah. So in order to build a real brand, you have to be consistent in terms of your message, in terms of, like you said, your tone of voice, what you're actually shouting about. And for a lot of organizations, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's really, really tough. And this really goes back to identifying a clear target audience. And I talk about this all the time. And if I look at some successful businesses, you look at Facebook, um, they started out just you know, creating a, a platform for Harvard students. If you look at Jeff Bezos, he just started building in books. And I, I look at it across different sectors, across different industries, and it's the same thing, identifying a clear niche audience to begin with, because you can be very clear in terms of who you are trying to attract. And I... I'll, I'll say this once again as an entrepreneur, this is something I did the hard way. And when you're an entrepreneur, it's, it's tough to do that because when you start the business, you're trying to get anyone who'll give you money, basically. So it doesn't matter if they're a startup or they're corporate or they're government or they're you know, big or small. It doesn't matter. You just try to take as much money. But one thing I always 
tell people is once you build a business over like maybe a year or two, um, you can start connecting the dots and say, okay, which type of industries do we like working with? What, which type of personas do we enjoy working for? Um, that's how we've kind of aligned on B2B marketing. And now we've shifted the podcast going back to why would did we originally start as Cup of Joe versus now it's the B2B marketing agent podcast. It's because I'll be honest, when I started the business, I had no idea who we were targeting. Okay. <laughs> It was, you know, I had a, a, some, some inkling of an idea, but it wasn't very clear. So to, to your point, now, even making that sh- subtle shift in terms of launching the, the podcast, uh, people are reaching out to me now saying, ah, you do B2B marketing. I said, yes, yes, we do. Um, so it's really, really honed in. Like I said, we've gotten a couple of new opportunities I was working on this morning from people going back to the consistent messaging, consistent value, and then that, that association, that perception of, B2B marketing and now brand building, putting together and then connecting with us. So it's it's worked out quite well, but it's definitely the long, tough road to get here. Thank you. And thanks for sharing that as well, Joe. Okay, here's an interesting one for you. I'd really like your view on this one. So within organizations, and obviously in multinational companies, you end up getting quite sizable in terms of scale and you end up with lots of teams across the world. You could end up with divisions. You could end up with business lines. You could end up with uh, all the way down to very small teams. But it usually ends up being a conglomeration of some description of a whole bunch of different teams potentially spread across the globe. Do you think, in mind of what we've just been saying about company brand and protecting and projecting the company's brand, Do you think that there is a role in the world for the team to also have a brand? What are your thoughts on that? In terms of building building the brand, the team, I mean, beyond the leadership team. Yes. So I'm talking about could be the software engineering team of a certain product, or it could be the, let's say the HR team. It could be any sub-segment of the organization where there's a leader that's the leader of that group, and they might have seven, eight, or nine Uh, team members, do you think there's a place in the world for them to also, within the organization, to have their own brand and their own identity? What are your thoughts on that? I think think absolutely. But I think because of your point, it's difficult to really understand what each each department does. So I think having that internal vision, that internal brand for your team can be extremely powerful in understanding what is the value you can bring to the different stakeholders. Because without that, I think a lot of people really struggle and there's divisions between marketing and sales and maybe marketing and procurement and HR and so on. So there's a lot of divisions within multinationals. And I think one thing that could bridge the gap to your point is having them build a team um, brand and also individuals within that. So if you look at it, it's definitely helpful internally, but it's, I think, even more uh, important externally. So if you look at a classic example is HR. If you're, you're hiring someone, I always tell people, yes, you're, you're, you're looking for you know, the, the company that's going to give you the most opportunities, but you're also looking for the right people you want to work with. That's becoming even more important nowadays is, do I actually want to work with this hiring manager? Is this team someone that I can, I can collaborate with and, and grow with together? So I think all these considerations are extremely important. Going back to the concept of marketing and sales, people buy people. And the same thing when you're trying to you know, build partnerships or you're trying to recruit uh, new candidates is they, at the end of the day, they want to see the people behind the brand. So I think giving them a voice, showing their stories is an exceptional way. And uh, you know, I've done it just recently. We, we started hiring recently. And it's funny because I've reached out to people in my LinkedIn network I've never met before in my life. And I said, hey, you know what? We have this opportunity coming up. Well, would you like to be interested? And several people have said, absolutely. And I said, okay, okay. <laughs> I love enthusiasm. And they're like, oh yeah, no, I know. I've been watching you for years. Like I feel honored that you would reach out to me. I'm like, okay, wow. Um, so it's, it's interesting, like the impact that, that, that brand and perception has, not only in terms of, you know, bringing new opportunities to the business, but also bringing the right people. Because I think that's something that a lot of leaders and businesses really struggle with is getting the right people on board. There's tons of people in Asia, obviously, But getting the right fit um, is extremely, extremely difficult. And it's getting even more competitive. We work in B2B tech now. And it's super competitive. Everyone wants to work at Google or Facebook and so on. So if you're not one of those guys, what do you do? And I think to your point, 
building that that brand within the team, um, showcasing those people, their voices externally, whether it's on the corporate channels or just highlighting them in different events internally can be an exceptional way of building that brand um, internally as well as externally. That's a great insight, Joe. And I think it partially answers the next question I'm going to ask, but I'm going to press on with it anyway, because I think we might continue that path. Do you think then for the individual leader within a business that there is a, a place for them to have their own personal brand that they also project? I think absolutely. Um, and I'll tell you why, because I was the person my entire life, I was very, very shy. I didn't do any public speaking. I was even terrified to speak in, in meetings. I would get panic attacks before big, big uh, presentations. So during most of my 20s, I think I really missed that in a lot of opportunities. To those people who had a clear brand and positioning within uh, the organization. So for me, I feel like once I made that shift, then it did uh, open up new opportunities, both internally and externally. Obviously, if it's a good organization, I want to stick with them. The caveat is, and I think this is where a lot of people really struggle, is how do you do it in a way where you don't come off as you know, too showy? Or how do you not take the spotlight? Because this is something that happened in my previous role, is that when I started getting featured in all these publications, I started you know, getting all these um, big leadership um, conference events I was speaking at, then other people within the organization kind of looked at me and said, okay, why is this person getting it? He's mm. not the CEO. He's not the, you know, he's not leading the organization. Why is he getting these opportunities? And I always try to explain to them, this is not something that I actively went out and did. Like I was not pitching for opportunities or press. It was just something that's going back to the brand I had built and I was educating people. So I think that is something that I think a caveat that some organizations are a bit hesitant. I always say, I don't know why, because if you have a good enough team, you have enough organization, you know, but it goes back to personal, you know, the ego. I think the ego yeah. going back to leadership is killing a lot of good leaders because they want to be the top dog or they want to be the, the alpha in terms of the organization. And for me, I've always taken the, I've always flipped it upside down. I said, my, my job as a leader should be to get my team to replace me. And even, even now, I said, I'm training you, I'm grooming you. Eventually, I want you to replace me or I want you to leave the company and start your own thing. And that's happened to me. My, my assistant recently, she's with us for three years. She started her own company um, in the baking business, doing very, very well now. So I said, I couldn't be happier for you because you applied what we, we've done over the past three years. You're building your own business. As an entrepreneur, like I had to applaud her. But I think that's a relatively unique perspective um, in a lot of organizations. There is still that hierarchy, that, that, that yeah. structure, particularly in Asia, that a lot of people don't want to, what, what's the saying in Japan? Like the uh, nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Yeah. And I, I see that a lot, particularly around Asian leaders, because uh, I've worked with a lot of Asian leaders. And I think that's one thing I really struggle with is how do I build a brand, but do it in a way where I'm not, coming off as too showy or kind mm. of uh, act like I'm still in the spotlight. You do have to be respectful and, and there are kind of cultural nuances to be aware of. Like you think about doing business in somewhere like Taiwan where, where the leaders will come into a room even in a specific order. They'll sit in a very specific seat and there's a lot of kind of cultural norms there that will probably take a long time before they break or if they ever do break. But my view is along the line of yours, that if you have a team member that's out there with a very powerful personal brand, it's actually good for everyone. It's good for the company. Yeah. It's good for the rest of the team. You should celebrate it, not, not necessarily knock it. But yeah, it's, uh, but you're right. You do have to be respectful of the culture and, and the like. I'm going to ask you some more personal questions about leadership now. So you've had a, a great career. Can you reflect on any particular leaders that you've had, and you can name them by name or it can be anonymous, any particular leaders that you've had that you consider to be particularly inspiring? Yeah, I think it's a good question because I, I've been fortunate to have leaders on both sides of the spectrum. I met those who are, uh, you know, left me quite demoralized and low self-esteem, and I've had those who have really... Uh, you know, helped elevate me. And I think one thing that's really, really helped, 
especially early in my career and even later on several years ago was they really, those who inspired me um, saw something in me. So they placed a lot of trust in me. I think that helped me build my own self-esteem, build my own self-worth in the organization because previously I was just getting whatever was thrown at me. And my favorite bosses that I've had in the past, they say, okay, here's the client, here's the opportunity, you know what, you run with it. If you need help, let me know. Otherwise, it's all yours. And I always really, really respected, respected that because it's not easy to do as a leader. It's really not to give uh, someone that much a freedom to do what they want. You have to either really, really trust them or you have to be the kind of leader that, you know, uh, believes in, in their team. So I think that is a leadership skill that I think that has always stuck with me. And I try to do the same thing with my team. I said, look, I'm not here to micromanage you. That's not my job. My, my job is to enable you to give you cool opportunities to elevate what you're doing, elevate your own skills, and then stay out of your way. That's, that's my goal as a leader. And I learned that from my previous bosses that that is an excellent way to not only build employees, but I think build that entrepreneurial mindset. Because I think it's something extremely important is more and more executives who are in mid-level or senior are looking to start their own organization, are looking to start their own business. I, I get requests all the time from people making them make a switch. And I said, make sure you have that entrepreneurial mindset. Make sure you are building that in your team giving them the opportunity to thrive. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you can't do everything yourself. It's impossible. Um, eventually, you have to delegate some of those things. So I think having that practice in an organization where you can fall a little bit um, is a great way to build not only your, your own, elevate your own position, but also elevate your team with you. I'm going to play that back later, in fact, because I almost felt like I could have been building a wonderful word cloud right there of some of the, the, the words that you're saying. And trust empowerment and you use the word elevate i don't know if you notice this you was the use the word elevate which isn't a word that's used a lot to to describe leaders but you use the word elevate it must have been half a dozen times so yeah really great now we've got to go to the converse now you, you open the door for this this one you probably should definitely be anonymous with but what are the attributes of the opposite leaders that didn't inspire you or that demotivated you what are some of the attributes that you've experienced there yeah i mean i, I think for me like going back to what you're saying is like you know the, the diversity has always been important to me and I've, I've always kind of been like the sole expat in many teams that I've, I've worked with and it was important for me that we're all on the same level like there, there's no differences between you or me if anything i raised you up higher than me um and i think i have had leaders in the past who have been, for lack of better words, racist or sexist oh. um, to many of the team members. And I've had this maybe a couple of times throughout my, my career. It's the same thing. And I've always kind of tried to jump on my sword to the point where I've, I got the nickname Papa Joe. My team's calling Papa Joe because I thought of my team, I was the parent and I had to protect them. And so I think if, if another colleague or another boss came and they were saying, you know, derogatory things and they were putting down a particular race or gender like that always something that really frustrated me and i always took that as fuel like i i you know i obviously fought within the system but i said what else can i do beyond that so when i started writing for forbes that's something i really really focused on is really going back to your point of empowering young female entrepreneurs so i did a lot of pieces on young local female entrepreneurs um i did stories on people with um you know dyslexia and other learning disabilities who are now successful. I did stories on people who had been laid off um, for, for, for you know, the wrong reasons. And I wanted to give them the voice because there are so many stories like this. I think everyone has a story where they've been kind of let down or they've kind of been brought down by whatever it is. And I said, let's, let's give them opportunity to, to elevate their voice. Like even being for Forbes, like I saw that as a responsibility my responsibility is to elevate those who need it most. And that's why I really, really focused on those in you know, uh, certain genders or certain kind of uh, backgrounds where they didn't have that opportunity. It was very important for me. Actually, my first, my very first uh, article that I wrote for Forbes, this was kind of controversial several years ago, was a gay couple in Beijing. Some of my good friends, uh, a gay couple in Beijing who started up a series of restaurant chains. Uh, one of them was American, one of them was Taiwanese, and they started up restaurant chains. And I still remember one of my very first comments 
uh, someone in the comment section was like, why are you writing about this gay couple? And then there was some slurs attached to that. And to me, I was like, well, I'm on the right track. I'm yeah. going to power through this because if you know people find it offensive, then that that's on them. But I think these people that I'm highlighting, I'm not necessarily going out of my way to highlight them because they're gay, but I'm highlighting them because they're inspirational to me. And I want them, I want their story to be told. And yes, it did come with some backlash initially, but I said, that's part of the game. I'm going to take it and I'm going to continue to let them shine. So that was one that I think really sticks with me today now. I really want to applaud that on multiple levels. These are the conversations that we must have. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of everyone for pushing agendas like that, first of all. And secondly, it's very topical at the moment. I'm really pleased to see this. There is a big push in the world for what we call allyship. And the point here is for diversity and inclusion, for us to make any meaningful impact in the world around diversity and inclusion, we need allies. It can't be just a handful of voices always speaking up. We need allies and we need to speak up for people. We need to, if, there, if someone is being excluded in the workplace, speak up and say something. If someone is being mistreated uh, on any kind of discrimination, whether it be gender, age, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be, we mm. need to be able to speak up for them. So thank you so much on behalf of everyone. You're a great ally, and that's the right word for this, uh, in the spirit of allyship. Uh, mm. You're a great ally and a great voice uh, in speaking up and creating those conversations that we must have if we're going to make a meaningful change in the world. Some of the things that I've been reading about some of your work that you've been doing, I really want to kind of plug on this one and, and see what's behind it. So I was reading something uh, that you wrote recently on LinkedIn around reciprocal emotion. What does that mean and, and how do we use that in a leadership context? Yes. So I wish it's something that I would have came up with, but it's from a book uh, by Robert Cialdini called Influence. And one of the things he talks about is the reciprocity principle. So uh, that basically means that people are more inclined to do something for you uh, when you do something for them. But I think the intention I wrote about this as a caveat is do something without expecting anything in return. I think it's extremely important. I think it's the way that I've kind of lived uh, my life and the way I kind of run the business. So I have done hundreds of free talks over the past few years for people who have been laid off, who people who are looking for new opportunities or whatever it is, who don't have the income to, you know, for our consulting services at the time. I said, let me still try to help you out. Let me still try to give you an opportunity to see. Um, so I think that's something that has, has really stuck with me and I've been trying to incorporate in what we're doing. Thank you, Joe. Oh, that's a, a really good concept. It's a it's a little bit like pay it forward, but it's but it's more about the the, the to and fro in in a an engagement or in a relationship. I really really like that concept. If I could, sorry, I'll expand on that a little bit deeper. Yeah, um, sure. One one thing I always try to credit to was like a debit and credit. Hmm. If you think if you think of the banking, I think it's the simplest analogy to think about. It. I think too many people try to withdraw too much from a relationship, especially too early. Okay. I think self people are notorious about this. Yeah. And the problem with that is you feel like your people are just buying something away from you. They haven't given you, they haven't credited enough into your account, such that there's a deficit. And I think that happens a lot in relationships where, you know, you're either asking for favors too early on, or you're asking for, you know, you know, advice or pay my brain kind of things. And you haven't really earned it. You haven't really credited um, that bank account. So I always try to use that analogy, make sure that you are adding enough value first. And if you do that often enough, you know, good things do, do happen to you. I, I honestly believe that like it's, I've seen it in my life and in different people's lives. So yes, to your point, absolutely pay it forward. Don't expect anything in return and just try to help out others. Thanks, Joe. And I encourage the audience to give this a, a go. The other one that got my attention, I saw you uh, talking about experiential learning. What, what does that mean? That, that's a very good point. So that was an interview with uh, Lee chong Jir, who is an experiential marketing expert. We actually former colleagues, and that's how we knew each other. We worked in an events experiential marketing company many, many years ago. And experiential marketing is essentially 
immersing the audience into the story or into the learning thing. For me, growing up, I was used to like the lecture style. So the professor talks, you listen, maybe he asks you a question every now and then. But for me, I never liked that as a student. And I said, okay, how can I change it? Or how can we change the way we do learning and get people on board as early as possible? So incorporating things like icebreakers, but even before that, what kind of exercises, what kind of activities can you do to spark them? And so in the interview, he's giving an example of, you know, uh, different teasers or different uh, uh, competitions or different things they had to unlock before they actually got to the actual uh, workshop. And I think that's important to understand. He brings up a very good point in terms of end-to-end holistic learning. So what are you doing pre, pre? because a lot of times we don't do pre very, pre very well. Um, we just send out a synopsis and say, okay, okay, 10 events. And, you know, you get people sitting in the room and they're kind of like, some people are excited and most people are like, what am I doing here? Mm. And so it's, it's always important to set the context early on. So can you do a short educational video or like a, a simple teaser, like saying, hey, guys, really excited to have you here. What are you talking about? This, this, and this. So get ready. Um, any, any little thing to get them excited on board is, is a great way to, to set the context early on. And then even when you're doing the actual workshop or training, one thing that I've tried to do, and I was doing this right before this call, is really outline it so there are clear activities throughout. So one way we structure it is to talk about, okay, practical tips. So we have maybe three practical tips. And then within that, we have examples and we have exercises. So we're not just saying, here's the tip. We're saying, okay, how can you apply that? Mm. So for example, we're doing, I was working on a storytelling uh, uh, workshop uh, outlined just a minute ago. And one of the things I, I wanted to kick it off and say, okay, here's a, here's a framework for storytelling. Let's kick it off. Tell me a story based on this. So as, as early as possible, getting them involved in the process, getting them feel like they're, they're part of the, uh, the training themselves. I always try to flip it around and say, okay, now pretend you're teaching me how would you flip it around and, and do it like that? Oh, so nice. yeah. working in different role plays has always been a good way to engage them because I think otherwise you just run the risk of talk, 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 and people may check their phones or zoning out. Yeah. Very, very common. I would do the same thing to the artist. So trying to flip it to make it more experiential. Yeah, I really like that. So it's like you're priming people before the event so that they get excited about it and they know what they're, they're in for. And secondly, very engaging style. And yeah, I think the certainly storytelling coming back to that, but also role playing, uh, both very powerful uh, techniques. Okay, f- final, final question for you, Joe, and, and then we're going to go on to just always give you the last say as well. But what's a one advice that you would give 20 year old Joe? So Back in the days, you're going to China, you're studying and the world is still your oyster, as it is now, by the way. But what advice would you give now to 20-year-old Joe? I think a couple of different things. I would say focus on relationships. This is something I didn't really learn until I was in China. I, thankfully, I went to China first because Guanxi and relationships are essentially how you do business in China. So I think really understanding how to build relationships, going back to the debit and credit, um, analogy is is extremely important. Um, the other thing which I think I wish I would have done is not chase uh, money <laughs> early in my 20s. I think this is a big mistake because I chased money. I took opportunities where I wasn't maybe right fit or I didn't really enjoy it. And so I really burned out or I just I wasn't adding as much value as I could have. So you really have to strike the balance between oh, what am I going to learn from this? So taking an opportunity to learn, do what you enjoy. Uh, versus chasing money. I think if you do that initially, if you learn as much as possible in your 20s, you will actually earn a lot more in your 30s and 40s rather than like I did, flip it their way. In my 20s, I tried to chase as much money. Didn't learn as much as I probably could have um, because like I said, I was taking the opportunities to make for money. And as a result, didn't actually make that much to be honest. <laughs> and now that I'm in my, my 30s and late 30s, like it's, it's, it's kind of happened organically because I just absolutely love what I'm doing. I think the enthusiasm shows and people want to be part of that. So naturally, it's kind of helped me build a business. Um, so that's something I would definitely tell my 20-something-year-old myself is to, to not chase money. <laughs> Fantastic advice. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. The last piece, and I didn't give you any pre-warning of this, so I apologize for that. But for all of our podcast guests, we always uh, give at the end an opportunity for you to 
to plug your own business, your own service, uh, anything you want to talk about. You can talk about uh, ESCO Media, you can talk about your podcast, all of the above. So uh, what would you like to share with our audience? So I'm, I'm notorious at not being able to plug my own, my own stuff, but I would just say, <laughs> If you, you found anything that was interesting, um, you want to connect with me, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, it's usually the best way. If you're interested in B2B marketing, check out the, uh, the podcast, B2B Marketing Asia, available on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere else you get iTunes. Um, I do have an online course on building engaging uh, content. So if any of that sounds inter- interesting to you, just drop me uh, a message on LinkedIn. We'd love to connect and talk more to you. Thank you so much, Joe. And I need to say it properly, Joe, the brand builder, Escobedo. Thank you so much for your time today. I know that's a, a big commitment for you to join us. You're a very busy person running a business, but I know that our audience loves to hear from people like you and hear your experiences and all of the things that you've learned. So thank you so much. It was a really great pleasure having you on the show today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to The Leadership Project with your host, Mick Spears. We really hope you enjoyed today's show with Joe, the brand builder, Escobedo. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button on your preferred podcast service, and it would be greatly appreciated if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or tell your friends about the show. Please do take care of each other out there, stay safe, and always remember to challenge the status quo.